Schönen Vormittag im Klangraum Krems Minoritenkirche. Willkommen bei den Europäischen Literaturtagen 2021. Über männliche Routen und weibliche Reisende. Reisen zum Oritsee ins alte Thrakien, über die Nordostroute durch Sibirien bis nach Korea, zum Himalaya und durch die Nachfolgeländer der Sowjetunion. Zwei weitgereiste europäische Schriftstellerinnen stellen sich die Fragen nach patriarchalen Reiseklischees und männlichen Reiseostereotypen. Wie werden sie heute aufgebrochen und wie definiert sich ein weibliches Reisen? Moderiert werden die Lesungen und die Gespräche mit den beiden Autorinnen wieder von Rosie Goldsmith. Thank you, Walter, very much indeed. Now we're going to switch to English and, um, and we're going to switch to women and we're going to speak a little bit more slowly than Peter Frankopan did, I promise. <laughs> um, and I cannot tell you how incredibly pleased I am to have these two women with me on stage. Now, Kapka Kasabova, you can see over there, looking gorgeous in, I think, an orange sweater. Are you, you're, in, you're in Scotland, aren't you, Kapka? That's right. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am sorry, I am just a talking head instead of a whole person today but I'm delighted to be to be here um, with you you are in a way. you are definitely <laughs> and uh, we we both embrace you and you've got um, as your fellow traveler as well and writer on stage we've got Erica Fatland so welcome to Erica as well <clears throat> now we have um, we have a wonderful sort of hour and a quarter, hour and a half possibly ahead of us where we're going to be talking to both Kapka and Erika about travel, about how women travel, and about, um, yeah, about lots. We've got readings as well, so we've got a whole raft of wonderful, wonderful gems and treats for you. And I want to sort of make a little bit of um, an observation beforehand because it is wonderful to have two female travelers. Now these aren't swashbuckling, daring do female travelers at all. They are adventurers, they are explorers, and they're um, above all fantastic writers. And I think in a way the skills of the writer and the poet and the reporter, the interviewer, is something I notice in both your books. And both Erica and Kapka have books translated into English and German, well, they've written in English, but this is Amzi, we've got here by Kapka. And Erika's latest is Hoch oben. Now, this is not yet in English, um, but it will be soon. It's being translated by a fantastic a translator who I know called Carrie Dixon. Um, but we do have the other books here. We have Kapka's book, which I've read, To the Lake, which is in English and in German and that's the German, and we have a lot of other books as well. My, my table is already groaning here. So just a reminder that you can actually buy the books, and um, Erica will be here to sign books. There's a book table outside in the corridor, and when we see Kapka again, we will queue up and we'll say, Kapka, I want my books signed. Now, 
lots to talk about. The first one I want to talk to you about being um, women on your own who travel. Uh, because we've had a lot of men talking about traveling, um, and I want to ask you both how you travel. Now, Kapka, what kind of traveler are you? <laughs> well, I think I'm, first of all, um, an excited traveler. Um, I, I seem to, I seem to f fall in love, or maybe love-hate, with a place. Um, you know, develop an obsession with a place um, from a first visit. And then that kind of, um, that fascination, that excitement, I think is my initial, um, my initial driving force, really, that I have to be excited about what I don't know about this place and its people, because for me, place and people are inseparable. Um, and what, yeah, how this discovery is going to unfold. And with this kind of excitement, there is always um, apprehension. Um, so it's a curious mix um, of, I suppose, a little bit of fear of the unknown, because I tend to travel in places that, yes, um, they are the Balkans and I am um, a native of the Balkans but they are not my comfort zones. Um, these are places that I kind of, um, I am drawn for, to precisely for, um, for these reasons, uh, you know, um, to discover and yeah, to begin some kind of inquiry. As, so as I am first of all, I think a curious traveler. <clears throat> Sounds good. Um, as, as you may notice, I don't give Wikipedia-style introductions to authors when I interview them. I much prefer you to be able to um, introduce yourselves through your words. And I think that just here maybe we should mention um, your own travel route, if you like, as a, as a human being, because you were born in Bulgaria. And uh, funnily enough, we, we think of you as a, as a British writer. You're also ours. You belong to the world, I know, but you belong to Bulgaria and Britain. But you also belong to New Zealand. You spent a long time in New Zealand as well. So New Zealand, Scotland, England at any point? <laughs> yes, one or two years in England. One or few yeah. years, yeah. And how long, were you, yeah. How, how long were you in Bulgaria? How long did you spend there as a child? Well, I grew up in Bulgaria, and uh, when I was a teenager, um, you know, I, I suppose our generation, my generation, came of age the moment the Berlin Wall came down. So I am of that generation. You know, we were in our teens, late teens, um, when the Berlin Wall um, came down. And um, I suppose my family was part of the first wave of, um, you know, the first exodus um, from, from Eastern Europe. And we emigrated to New Zealand, where I spent over a decade. Um, I was educated there, university educated there, and I published my first books there before moving to Scotland um, 16 years ago. So English became my literary language, um, you know, from my 20s onwards. I used to write in Bulgarian as a young, as a very young person. And then I became a Francophone through, you know, through education. And then I started learning English in my late teens. Um, you, yeah. So the languages you speak, you speak French and you speak Russian, I think, do you? Or, and Spanish. <laughs> Very rusty. Very rusty. We were just talking. We were talking. About rusty languages. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. I mean, we, we haven't had as m many opportunities to speak our languages. But anyway, that's fantastic for the moment. Thank you, Kapka, very much indeed. And Erica, the same sort of question to you, really, because you, um, we've established that Kapka was born in Bulgaria. You're Norwegian. Um, Norwegians we always think of as being great explorers for certain reasons, but not so many women. So what kind of traveler are you? Okay, I would say like Kapka, I'm a very curious traveler as well. Um, I travel like Kapka to meet people first and foremost, and I ask them so many questions. Like when I was traveling in North Korea, I was driving my guides insane with all my questions. And then um, driven by curiosity to discover 
places I know very little about. And that is actually how I became a travel writer, because it was never my plan or my dream to become a travel writer. But um, 10 years ago, I got an idea, or actually I got a title, uh, Sovietistan. And I thought, well, that is a nice title. I think I will write a book with that title. And then I wrote a book about all the countries ending with Stan in Central Asia uh, that had been part of the former Soviet Union um, countries I knew nothing about. We know, we know them as like far away Stan. And I was just very curious what had become of those countries when, uh, after the experience with the Soviet Union. And then I tend to have I mean, I always travel with some kind of question. So in Sovietistan, my question was, um, yeah, like I said, what, what came out on the other side? What, what are those countries like now? What is the heritage of the Soviet Union? And then I had another idea. Actually, it was a dream. I dreamt that I was walking on a map, a large map. I was walking from country to country. And then north of the red line, there was always the same country, Russia. So when I woke up, I had the idea um, to write the border, uh, to travel around the biggest country in the world, um, to find out what it means to have the biggest country in, your, in the world as your neighbor. How does that affect you? So I always have these questions that I want to find an answer to. And then I tend to have very long and ambitious travel routes, so my research journeys usually last for eight, nine months. I, I, I must say that um, I would love to have had a dream like that, dreaming to, of walking on a map. I will, I will remember that, I think, for a long time to come. So your, your background was where you were born in Norway and, um, and you've basically stayed in Norway. It's always been your base, however far you've travelled. Uh, well, no, um, I'm from a very small town in Norway, uh, on the west coast, with a couple of thousand inhabitants. And when I was a teenager, uh, I couldn't get away from there fast enough. Um, and then I discovered there is this program where as a Norwegian student or pupil, you can go to France and uh, do high school in France. So I did that uh, when I was 16. And that kind of, even if France is not as exotic uh, as India or Central Asia, um, still for me as a 16-year-old to come to Lyon, a big city, uh, to learn another language, it kind of for me, opened the world, and as a 16-year-old, I had to, I mean, there was a Norwegian teacher there, we weren't completely on our own, but still I had to um, manage a lot of practical things, like if there was something wrong with the electricity, we had to call the electricity man and explain him in French what the problem was. So um, after that experience, I felt that the world was open, that I could go anywhere, that I could do anything. You are a very great linguist. I mean, everybody we're talking to today speaks languages, which is, you know, is, is fantastic. But you really do speak a lot of languages. Uh, you speak eight languages, is that correct? Yeah, eight or nine, depending on how you would count the rusty languages. <laughs> and, and then it's, I mean, learning a language, it's, it's a process that never ends. Um, but it's an obsession for me. I really love languages. Um, and it's a hobby. Um, I don't cook, I don't knit, I study grammar. <laughs> wow, okay, all right. <laughs> I'll move on quickly from that one. I must say my great love of languages was because I could actually speak them. Um, I really never excelled particularly in writing languages. But um, I want to also bring up a point which I think is interesting in both your lives, is you both originate in quite small countries. Um, Bulgaria, from what I remember, has got about seven, seven million population, something like that. And Norway, about five million. So quite small countries. And I wondered whether the urge to travel also came from that reason. Now, Kapka, of course, when you were younger, you couldn't travel very far before the, the Berlin Wall fell. Tell me. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I suppose... For, for all of those um, Europeans who grew up behind the Iron Curtain, travel was something of a, because it was an impossibility or beyond the Iron Curtain anyway, you could travel within the Eastern Bloc um, and certain other countries perhaps. Um, the whole idea of travel in itself was exotic. Um, 
obviously we're talking about pre you know globalization anyway um but really the border just loomed so large in everybody's lives um and i think for me in particular as someone who was probably just born to be a i don't know born to always try to escape always try to cross the line um i love um erica's dream you know i call these dreams geographical dreams because i've always had geographical dreams i think vladimir nabokov talks in one of his novels i can't remember which one um, about linguistic nightmares <laughs> maybe erica can relate to that you know grammatical nightmares but for me it's always been geographical dreams and geographical nightmares and they are always highly kind of emotional highly scenic just very dense with experience and meaning um so yes um i think you know there is the element of fate and personality who we are born to be and i think something in me has always propelled me um you know to explore to inquire in geographical settings not in an abstracted way only but in an embodied way and secondly i think there is the circumstances in which you know we are born and i think for me travel became an obsession because of my childhood behind the iron curtain erica what about for you i mean the fact that norway is a small country does that have any bearing at all or is it i mean all the i mean i know norway very well and all the norwegians i know just love traveling <laughs> constantly uh, yes we do have a um, long tradition going back to the vikings and further back of of traveling and um, as you can see, i am from the west coast and as you can see i look like i'm from ireland so obviously there's been connections in traveling uh, for a long time um my mother uh, was also very fond of uh, traveling uh, and then she got me and i kind of destroyed all her plans to to travel <laughs> um so but we don't actually have that many travel writers in norway anymore and it's quite interesting when i got the idea to write sovietistan um i met very little enthusiasm and everyone was like travel writing isn't that kind of passé who is writing travel books nowadays isn't the world already discovered by nansen and helge ingstad and all those men that lived before us um so my publishing house that did believe in the book they actually had to call every bookshop in norway individually and beg them to um have the book in their uh, shop gosh Now I'm sure they're eating their words now or as one very famous um, female travel writer who I can't remember her name actually she actually ate her boots when she was on a trip because she was so hungry um we'll talk more about other female travel travel writers later. but th there is a difference between traveling and writing about it and you've brought that up already not every traveler becomes a travel writer and I wonder when I mean travel writing is a profession as well Is there ever a, a difficulty for you when you travel the fact that you know that you've got to write about it everything has to be documented every story every anecdote is there a kind of pressure as well when you become a travel writer Yes I never dreamt as I said to become a travel writer but I always since I was 8 years old and discovered that there was a profession that you could actually have as a profession to write books the books that you find in the library uh, from then on I decided I wanted to be a writer of course when the, when the grown ups asked me I always said that I wanted to be a surgeon or a doctor or something that would not make them smile um, but that was always my dream and I love what I love about travel writing is that it's um a very open genre uh, you can really put anything into a travel book you can write poetry you can write about history cultures meetings you can write about yourself if you want to um it's it's incredibly open um but writing about travels and traveling it's really two very different stages i feel um of of the creating the book so first i travel I never start writing the book until I'm done with the research. Um while travel how, how long will you research before you start to travel? 
Uh, well, um, it's a mix of planned research and um, spontaneous research and accidental meetings. So something is planned, something is not planned. It also, of course, depends very much on the destination. Um, if well, you, you have, you've chosen quite difficult destinations. Yes, both of, course. of you, quite of course, complicated when, places, which are potentially dangerous. Potentially dangerous, but first and foremost, very difficult to visit um, as a journalist or as a writer. Uh, countries that don't really like that kind of attention. Uh, for instance, North Korea, um, if I had told them I was a writer, I would never get a visa. Um, I think the North Korean embassy is the only embassy in the world, or, or very few embassies at least, who demands um, kind of a document from your employer so that they can see where you work. And then I had to become creative because um, I've never really had a job. Uh, but my family, uh, they own the biggest slaughterhouse business. Uh, a casino. In, <laughs> in Norway. <laughs> I do, I'm a vegetarian. Uh, but then when I went to North Korea, I made them write a document that I was working as a receptionist at the slaughterhouse um, in Oslo. And that was the best cover-up I could ever have dreamt of. Like, no one asked me any questions about it's my It's not job. on your CV, though. <laughs> I haven't seen that at all. But um, I'm sure that uh, the North Koreans admire the profession um, very much, but um, po possibly less as a travel writer. Um, Kapka, how about you? I mean, how about this idea of travel writing and the, the difficulty or the difference between traveling and travel writing? Um, are you a spontaneous traveler? Do you do lots of research before you go on your trips? You know, this is such um, an, a, a well, I think it's, it's a very good question, very, very well articulated, um, which is not often asked when we talk about travel writing. And in fact, the, I think the question, there is the question of what is travel writing. Um, and in the latest issue of the British magazine, Granta. It's out, just um, out now, isn't it? Travel writing travel issue, yes. Yeah, um, in the introduction by the uh, guest editor, William Atkins, who is a wonderful travel writer, he wrote The Immeasurable World about, about deserts. Um, he quotes, um, you know, he asks that question, what is travel writing? What, um, incidentally, the title of this issue of Grant is, should we have stayed at home? <clears throat> which is, um, which is quoting the, the, Elizabeth Bishop. Which is the question we're all asking now. Should we have stayed at home? Mm. Yeah, so I mean, the fact that yeah. this, this, I'll just explain very briefly about the Granta magazine, because I think it's really interesting that you bring it up, because Granta is a wonderful um, magazine, literary magazine, um, which is brought out now all over the world, but in English and Spanish, I think, as well. And this, I just noticed that this week, this very week, this issue on travel writing in a pandemic has just been published. It's fascinating, isn't it? It is, and William Atkins, the, edit, the guest editor who commissioned all these writers for this issue, um, asks rather profound questions about the nature of, well, literary form, the nature of travel, the nature of being a stranger in a place, relying on the kindness of others, you know, being hosted um, in a territory that is not yours. You know, you are at the mercy of this place and its people. Um, and he quotes, um, you know, the previous editor of Grant Magazine who famously said, you know, described the essential amphibianism of travel writing. It is an amphibian genre, which is what Erica was, was just saying. It's a very open literary form. And I love that because I am, you know, I'm also a poet and a novelist and I don't actually see myself as a travel writer. I see myself as a storyteller um, who writes about place. So all my, it's not even that I write about places. It's not even that I have written about these lakes, Ohrid and Prespa. It is that, you know, the lakes wrote themselves through me. It is a kind of, um, it is an encounter. I mean, I experienced the, you know, the, the encounter with the place, with these two lakes, for example, and all their, worlds within worlds within worlds starting with my family because my grandmother is from these lakes as a kind of process and as Erica was saying it, it is potentially an, a kind of infinite process of research 
and experience and you discover new depths. And I want it to be that way. I want my books to be an experience that changes me, first of all. And then, of course, I hope that, you know, readers will go through something similar um, in their own in their own way. I'm very struck by the fact that you say you started off as a poet and a novelist and then have bec become a travel writer because these are just labels, aren't they, really? Um, it is a profession, even if the North Koreans don't um, recognize it as a profession. It is a profession. Um, do you see yourself as just a writer and a traveler or do you th is it important that this genre, if you like, of travel literature is, is elevated more, especially as there are so few women? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Um, I personally have a problem with uh, the word travel writer, maybe not so much in English, more in Norwegian, because we don't really have a good word. And then I often end up having to explain people that I don't write the Lonely Planet kind of travel books. Um, I write books that you can actually read. Uh, so I think of, I mean, good travel writing should be like any other good literature. It should first and foremost be good literature. And uh, so the real job, of course, the research is very important. If you don't do any good research, you have nothing to write about. But still, um, the best research in the world can be totally ruined if you don't know how to transform it into literature, into words. So the real job uh, starts when I'm back home or wherever I am, and I start writing. And then I do the whole journey again, uh, but then in front of my computer. And that's the most important part of the job. Do you fictionalize any of your trip? I don't fictionalize. Um, when you write nonfiction, there is this contract between you and the reader that they should be able to trust you, that you don't lie, that you don't make anything up. And then still, um, as your journey becomes literature, of course, it also kind of becomes fictionalized because you um, shorten a dialogue, you choose to include something, uh, something else you take away. Um, also, traveling in authoritarian states, I have to be very, very careful um, not to create any trouble for the people that I've met there and who don't know that I'm going to write about them. Do you, you change people's names? I change names, something, sometimes even more than that. When I was in Tibet, uh, which is probably one of the most authoritarian places, most controlled places on earth, I actually had to uh, make up meetings. So the, I mean, all of the words, all of the uh, quotes are true. People did say those things to me, but uh, the encounters are actually totally made up because otherwise, um, I mean, if, if you just have a photo of Dalai Lama on your phone, you would go to prison. So I don't want to create any problems for anyone. Kapka, do you have to compromise as well? Do you, do you elaborate or imagine as you write? I love, yeah, I love what Erica just said um, on the issue of the contract you have. So you have a contract, I think, as a, as a non-fiction writer, but I think non-fiction is too broad. Let's narrow it down. You, know, you have a contract as a writer of places and people, um, first of all, with yourself, then with the people that you're going to write about, um, because they, you know, you are on their turf, you are a guest. Um, and thirdly, you have a contract with the reader. Um, and I think the contract with the reader is very important. It's not just an ethical contract, it's also an artistic contract that you don't tell the reader more than the book needs to tell the reader. So that is where you know, the artistic dimension comes in, which is what Erica was saying, you know, you have to shape your, um, you know, all your stories, all your immense kind of, and you always end up with an overwhelming um, kind of amorphous mass of um, obviously information that you learn yourself in the process of moving with people and, and you know, stories, but also, a huge amount of kind of psycho-emotional material. Mm. Uh, at least, at least you know, this is my experience because I am a psychological writer above all. Mm. Um, so I'm after the psychological truth of a place and a story 
um, you know, rather than the factual. Obviously, the factual is very important, but it's only part of a kind of ecosystem of, um, you know, the truth is an ecosystem, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> like my lakes, Lake Ochrid and Lake Prespa are a complete um, ecosystem, perhaps three million years old, at least one million years year old. Um, and it is only human interference that has kind of broken up this ecosystem of truth through conflict, you know, through ignorance, through greed. Um, so yes, how to kind of work with this? I suppose I'm interested in complete experience because that is life is complete, you know, everything happens simultaneously. Um, a little bit like um, I'm going to read an excerpt about this Sufi saint uh, who could simultaneously appear in seven different places, you know, like all the mystic figures of the East, simultaneous, but that is the nature of life. And I find, you know, when I'm in a place like um, Lakes Ochrid and Prespa, there is a simultaneity of experience because the place is so rich, you know, it has such depths. And I think the greatest challenge for me is to capture that in, a, in an understandable way. Um, because often I do have a kind of, you know, almost a mystical experience in these places. These are very particular um, kind of electrically charged places because of the depth of history, of suffering that people have endured but also because um, of the nature there. And, and to me, nature speaks as loudly as, you know, as anyone I meet. Um, you and know, that, that, and that's, that's, really, that's really what, I mean, both of you bring such different life experiences to your writing. And I think that's really clear. I'm, let's, let's focus a little bit on your, your work now, Kapka, and then we'll have a reading from you as well, if we may. But what's interesting, again, listening to you both, you're both describing, of course, contemporary journeys, but they're, in both cases, confronting the legacy of, say, the Soviet Union, particularly the Soviet Union, the Cold War. Um, it's, it's fascinating to hear you both talk about these, because these areas, Norway, one always has to remember, Norway and Russia are actually really close. And of course, growing up in Bulgaria, you're surrounded by so many countries, so many different influences. And it's sort of, it always makes complete sense to me that you go to these countries to explore because they're part of you to a certain degree. Um, and I love your poetic approach to travel, Kapka. I really love it, it's beautiful. And you did, as you say, you started as a poet. Um, you published at quite a young age when you were in New Zealand first of all, and then novels, as you say, as well. And then the two books that, um, that we have um, here, the, the travel books, if you like, that, um, To the Lake, and you're writing then also another book at the moment, I think it's called Elixir, it's going to be called Elixir. Um, and you're going to be right, and, and you've written about borders as well. You've both written border stories. So um, very clever programming, I think, on the heart of Walter Grant here. But um, tell us about this book, To the Lake. And you've spoken a little bit about your grandmother, your personal approach to this, to this story. Um, why did you have to go there? Why did you have to go to Ochrid and Prespa? Hmm. Yeah, it was, um, once again, um, the usual mix of being drawn, being attracted to this place, and anyone who has been to Lake Ochrid. Um, have you been, Erica? Um, just checking. I, I have actually. So I have you. Yes, have and you? I went just after the, the the wars, so with the BBC. So I know all these areas that all of you are talking about. So, it's, ah, which is why it's so amazing to read your books, you know. So you have seen that amazing light yeah. above the lake, you know, and its first name, in fact, um, was uh, Lakos Lichnitis, which in Greek means um, a place of light, lake of light. It has a very particular light, which I discovered um, was due to the nature of 
um, the surrounding mountains, which are karstic, so it's limestone, and the water that um, filters from Lake Prespa, which is 600 meters higher up, through the mountain that separates the two lakes into Lake Ohrid, means that the water has a particular kind of pristine um, quality, crystal clear quality. Um, and that, you know, is partly responsible for this, for this light. Sometimes you can look at the lake from the top of one of the mountains around and it, you can't see the water. It's like a crater of light. So the water has this kind of immaterial quality. It's, it's very strange. So I was drawn to the place because, you know, it's an exceptional place, but more importantly, because it's my ancestral place um, and I had never explored it before. So my matrilineal line comes from uh, the town of Ohrid, which is um, the oldest inhabited place on the lake. So on the Macedonian side? On the Macedonian side, we should straight away say that these two lakes are shared by three countries. Um, so you have the paradox of water borders. Um, you know, a triple water border exists in Lake Prespa. Um, three countries share it. So I'm sure we'll return to this question of borders, but, um, you know, I think this sense of going somewhere unknown and at the same time returning to an ancestral place of origins, that was um, a kind of new thing for me because, you know, I grew up with my grandmother who for me was a person of the lake. She was a woman of the lake. She carried this lake with her, even though it was on the other side of the border with Yugoslavia at the time. And... Yes, we visited maybe twice in my childhood. We visited as a family. We had a special permit to go across the Yugoslav border because we had relatives there. My grandmother's whole family um, were in Ohrid um, and in Skopje, uh, which is, you know, um, Macedonia. Um, so I had a fascination, I think, with the place and also the legacy of my grandmother. So one of the questions that I began with, Erica mentioned that she always has a kind of question or, a, or an inquiry. And one of my questions was, um, where does this pain come from? Where does this suffering come from that I have inherited down the, the mother's line from my mother, from my grandmother, from my great grandmother? There is always this kind of, um, yeah, the legacy, I have always been aware of a, of a certain heavy legacy. And I knew that it came from the lake, from Macedonia, uh, via my grandmother. So this was one of my, uh, my inquiries. And, you know, it's very hard, I think, to face, to face such legacies in our lives. We all have them. You know, we all carry, we all carry our, ans our ancestors. <laughs> you know, they kind of, if you imagine them behind, you know, behind yourself, you know, we have a huge army of ancestors behind us. You know, they support us, but they are also heavy. And so for years, I wanted to go back to the lake and really, really get to know it. But I was afraid. And I think I had to first write my previous book, Border, um, which was a kind of maturing, it was, a, yeah, it was, it matured me and it gave me the courage to then face the depths of, of the lake. Um, but you, you, you said it was, you felt the pain and you could, you could feel the pain. Maybe you just need to be, because it's quite an abstract idea, um, a little bit more concrete in the sense of what you meant by that, but also how you... Um, how you coped with the fear of that, because you were going somewhere possibly dangerous for you, personally, psychologically. Yeah, psychologically. I mean, the lakes are extremely, um, you know, one of the most peaceful places <laughs> on earth, um, you know, to, to be around at this point in time. But psychologically, it was tough. But I, 
it, it would have been harder and more painful not to do it because I came to a, to a kind of, I came to a point in my life um, where I just couldn't take the, the cycle, this cyclical suffering anymore. And I'm talking about illness in the family, you know, there's always someone ill in the maternal line, you know, it's either me, you know, I become ill or, or then I recover and my mother becomes ill. Mm. And I started this at, at a time when I was actually quite unwell. I came up with the idea and I realized, you know, something is pulling me to the lake as I was recovering from my illness. Um, and actually coming up with the idea of writing about the lake helped me recover. <laughs> So I was physically well enough to actually set off on the journey. So it was part of a healing for me. Um, and that was just the beginning. As soon as I recovered, my mother became very seriously ill, you know. And my grandmother died young of cancer. And there's always been this sort of rumbling of illness in the women in the family. My aunt in, in Ohrid um, died in her 30s. You know, so these women sort of, um, you know, these kind of illnesses, and if it's not a physical illness, it will be some kind of acute, you know, relationship uh, crisis, you know, ma the marriages. So I wanted to look at mothers and daughters, men and women, you know, Macedonians, Albanians and Greeks and Bulgarians. And gradually I realized that, well, nations are just large families and it all begins, you know, in the family. So the psychological principles that apply, you know, to family dynamics, mothers and daughters, for example, can be also seen, you know, they kind of radiate out into the collective and they can be seen on a large scale when we look at how two neighboring nations, for example, talk to each other, mm. there is, because you mentioned borders and because that is one of mine and Erica's, you know, themes, you can't really avoid it. You can't avoid borders in the Balkans specifically. Um, there is a checkpoint on Lake Prespa between Greece and Macedonia. And that checkpoint is right on the lake. It's a beautiful, um, beautiful place. Um, and it has been disused um, since the late 60s when there was a military junta in Greece. It was unilaterally um, cut off by the Greek side for political reasons, and it has not been reopened. And that checkpoint of the lake, you know, this road which just ends suddenly, and there is a lonely kind of border patrol on the Macedonian side and sometimes on the Greek side and they are bored and sad and they just kind of play backgammon together and have a drink in the evening by the lake with all the migratory birds. For the birds, there are no borders. This, you know, discontinued checkpoint on the lake, I think says it all about the nature of borders. It means that if you want to visit, for example, if you are in Macedonia and you want to visit the Greek side, you can't just go through the checkpoint and visit the first village on the other side. You have to go over the mountains. These are, you know, Alpine mountains. These are Alpine roads. Over the mountains, enter Greece through another checkpoint, far away from the lakes. Re-enter Greece and then drive all the way down to Lake Prespa, only to end up at the same place where you started, but on the other side. And it takes, I don't know, five, six hours. It's crazy. You could write a book just about that one checkpoint. In fact, checkpoints, there's another whole book, I'm sure. Um, Kapka, this is really powerful stuff. I mean, it's incredibly moving to hear you talk like this as well. And I'd love it if you could read a passage for us now and just talk us through your, the passage you've selected for us. I'm going to read you a little, um, a little story from um, some, a, a chapter called Roads. And this is set in the town of Ohrid. My memory is not 
what it was, said Slavce. It's all jumbled up, the weddings and the funerals. Slavce and I were sipping tea from tulip-shaped glasses in the family restaurant by the Teke. A Teke is a Sufi lodge. Slavce's fine-boned face was drawn, but she was as poised as ever. Observing Ohridians, the people of Ohrid, the travel writer Rebecca West wrote, here in Ohrid, the conspicuous personages are slender old ladies with shapely heads, feline spines, fine hands and feet, and the composure that sharply, rather than placidly, repulses recognition of all in life that is not noble. A more aristocratic type can hardly be conceived." Unquote. The homely mosque was built in 1590, long before the Teke itself was founded in the 1720s by a dervish named Mehmet. Mehmet belonged to the Halvati Tarika, or order of dervishes, and Tarika means road in Arabic, the road of the spiritual seeker. There are 12 Sufi roads, and the Halvati road had three branches. This one is indigenous to the Western Balkans. Anyway, Slavci said, 12 is a magic number in Sufism. You have 12 imams, 12 letters in the declaration of faith, and 12 lines of poems. And she recited a line from the Persian poet Rumi, swaying between joy and sorrow, you are the prey of the transient. So this chapter is partly the story of this family um, who are a mixed family, ethnic Turks and um, Macedon and Christian Macedonians. Um, and you know the, the the presence of the ethnic Turks, so she married an ethnic Turk who was um, who was the sheikh, the last proper sheikh of of the of this Sufi lodge, um, is very old. The ethnic Turks have been there since the Ottoman invasion in the 14th century, the late the late 14th century. Um, so it's partly the story of this extraordinary woman who has been through personal loss, political turmoil during the war in Kosovo next door. And the story of Balkan Sufism in this particular order. I talked to her son as well, um, to the whole family. And really, I mean, this was one of the many kind of surprises for me that the lake um, has, you know, still has these, um, much has been destroyed, of course, but there, are, there is still enough on the ground, you know, for, you know, for, for the complete kind of truth to be glimpsed, you know. It's, um, it's hard work, though, and you've had to put a lot of work into finding those truths on the ground, I think. I mean, it's incredible skill, an incredible book as well. And in fact, it strikes me that the subtitle of To the Lake is A Journey of War and Peace. You went to some really difficult places, and obviously memories of war um, were, were very, very present as well. And I think, again, that's something you know, both, both you have in common, um, and you spoke speaking about borders as well, but the, the mere fact that you're exploring these, these, war, these, these places of war, how do you feel at that? Do you feel a kind of joy that that's behind you, or a fear? that it will come again? Well, you know, these are, I think, <laughs> yeah. to quote Rumi again through Slavce, swaying between joy and sorrow, you are the prey of the transient. Yes, I think all of these emotions, I think you have to experience as a, as a writer, as an explorer, and also as someone who holds people's stories. And I feel very privileged and I think joy Joy is a good word when I, for example, you know, when I can sit down with someone like Slavce 
mm. you know, of an afternoon, have a cup of tea, watch, you know, the old town, you know, go by um, and learn deep truths and deep history and um, I think there is a, a process somehow of trans, um, transformation in all of that. And yes, in particular, uh, my journey on the Greek side of Lake Prespa um, was traumatic because it's a traumatized place. It's traumatized um, by the Greek civil war. Um, you know, the first real war of the Cold War. Yeah. And the legacy of that war is in the land, the fact that 90% of the people left and the remaining people, you know, carry the trauma still. Um, so I think facing, facing the force, you know, the darkness, facing these forces of conflict, discord, um, denial, war, in other words, is absolutely essential. I think we, we have to do it in our personal lives. And for me, this was both personal and, um, and impersonal, you know, this journey, this book. And I think that we each have to do it in our own lives, in our own families. Um, because as my grandmother used to say, the Balkans, that's us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, our whole world is balkanized at the moment. And yet it is complete. It, there are certain things you cannot separate. Um, and so, you know, I was very interested to see, um, you know, to collect stories of separation and reunion, escape and return. Um, yes, war and peace. And in a way, you know, this illness, this illness that, um, that is war, that is, that, is the, that is war mentality, you know, the state of mind which produces war, you know, is, a, is an insanity. And this has, you know, the legacy of this is still in the land. Wherever you go in the Balkans, you are never far away from trauma, from a border. And really each border is, you know, a traumatic, is a traumatic border, is a traumatic place because it's unnatural and recent. Yes. And because it separated families and it just cut lives in half. And these are some of the stories I, I heard. Um, but in a strange way, I came out of this um, uplifted and joyous and hopeful. Wow. And if you read the books, you'll definitely feel, you'll feel both because it's about dichotomies, isn't it? I mean, Erica, let's talk um, at greater length about your writing too, but there are so many reflections, I think, and you, I mean, the, I hope Cap can see we're nodding away here because, you know, we, we, we're sort of trying to also tell you we are hearing everything you say and, you know, feeling it as well, but to be able to do what you do, I mean, you have, in your writing life, chosen, your traveling life, chosen some incredibly difficult topics and um, for people who don't know your other writing, I mean, you wrote about Beslan and Otoya, the massacre in Otoya, and, and then now you've written your border books and your Russian books as well, and we'll talk about those. But I wonder, is there something in you that's seeking out these difficult places? Um, well, I think it's more important to have an interesting life than to have an easy life. Uh, so I seek challenges or I try to go to places where it's interesting, but it often starts with the idea. So for instance, um, my first book, which was actually first, it was my master thesis in social anthropology, uh, when I went to Beslan to write about the aftermath of the school massacre in 2004, where uh, more than 300 people, most of them children, uh, lost their lives. And that also started with a question. I remember that on the first anniversary of the tragedy, uh, journalists again went to Beslan to write about uh, how people were coping. And then I asked myself, well, um, now what? Uh, after these journalists leave and they will never come back, uh, how can such a small community continue to live on 
after experiencing such a trauma. And so, so first I got the idea, and then I started uh, looking on the map <laughs> and learned that, well, first I just thought that, well, Beslan is not Chechnya, so it should be possible to go there. And then I discovered, well, it's actually just a few kilometers away from Chechnya. And it turned out it was incredibly difficult to get a visa. And it ended up um, with me having to have two armed bodyguards um, during my entire field work for three months. Uh, I think I'm the only student of so social anthropology who has done field work with armed bodyguards. Um, but they were luckily very lazy, uh, so they didn't bother me too much. They preferred to sit in the car and play on these small computer games. <laughs> Goodness. So you, were, you weren't exactly a solo female traveller at that point. You had your two useless bodyguards. But, yes. but, there, but there is the element of danger, though, nonetheless. I mean, it yes. was a very dangerous place. But it starts with the idea, and then when the idea is there, I want to go through with it, and then comes the assessment of danger, but then I'm already obsessed with the idea, and I want to go there. And then I think it's probably more scary for my mother and my husband who are waiting at home than for me who's actually there. I mean, as you must know, um, the world all, often seems more scary from afar than when you're actually there. Um, and then also there are some things out of my control. Um, I'm not a war correspondent. I would never go to a war zone. Um, then when I got, had a dream about the border of Russia, that was in February 2014. Mm -hmm. And then just a week after that, Russia uh, occupied Crimea, and then the war broke out in eastern Ukraine. So suddenly that border that I was going to write about became, I would say, very lively. Um, <laughs> yes, I think that's called an English understatement. But, um, yeah. but then, of course, I had to go to Donetsk as well. If I was going to write about the Russian border, I could not skip the most interesting part of that border at that time. But it was... It didn't start with me uh, wanting to have some thrill and excitement in my life and go to war zone. No, it started with the idea. They always accuse journalists, people like me, um, of being addicted to danger. And you're saying very clearly you're not a journalist and you're not addicted to danger. What are, are you addicted to just interesting places? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Um, and maybe addicted to adventure, to, to discovering the world, maybe addicted to traveling. I think that can become very addictive because um, when you are traveling, no day resembles the other. You have no idea what, you will, what will happen that day, who you're going to meet. So it's like when you're traveling, time in a way expands, it becomes longer. Um, and that can certainly be very addictive. Um, let's talk about the very specific books now. You mentioned um, your travels through Russia. Well, the first book in 2014 um, was Sovietistan, and that's an account of your travels through five post-Soviet nations, the Central Asia, uh, Asian nations, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. Um, beautiful beautiful places, but very mysterious. Um, why did you choose those? Because not many people had really done a whole kind of travel ex exploration of that area. I know, and at that time when I wrote the book, um, there was no other book uh, that covered the whole area. And so I thought, well... Did you realize you were going to go to all the stands, or did you just want to go to one first? No, no, I wanted to go to all of them. And I think you're ambitious, them. aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get these big ideas, and they tend to become bigger and bigger. Um, now, I wanted to go to all of them because um, it's an area that we know so little about. It's, uh, as I said initially, we tend to call it just far away stands, the stands, are treating it as one similar area. But I'm sure like, like the Balkans, um, it's, it's a very diverse area. Those countries are very, very different from each other. Uh, let's just talk about nature. So in Turkmenistan, you have more than 80% desert. 
Uh, in Tajikistan, you have more than 90% mountains. And then you have Kazakhstan, which is the ninth largest country in the world. It's just enormous. Uh, you have Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, that's a relatively wealthy countries. And then you have uh, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, that are very, very poor. Um, all of them, except for Kyrgyzstan, are more or less authoritarian. So that's what they really have in common. And of course, they were all part of the Soviet Union. And what was the question you asked yourself before you undertook that journey? Because well, you're both I, talking about questions you're trying yes. to ask and answer. So my, the main question for me um, when I was writing Soviet, Sovietistan, and that kind of also lies in the title, uh, is what is the legacy of the Soviet Union? Because the other countries that were part of the Soviet Union, they were Western countries like um, Estonia, Latvia, or they had been part of the Russian Empire for a very long time. Um, in Central Asia, they were not Christian, they were Muslims, most of them. Um, they spoke Turkish or um, Tajik, which is, um, uh, oh, help me, the Iranian. Other languages, Tajik and Uzbek. And, yeah, so yeah. very different languages, very different cultures. These countries actually didn't exist as countries um, before they became part of the Soviet Union. So they be did become part of the Russian Empire uh, in the 18th, 19th century, but th that didn't change the cultures that much. The big change, the enormous change, happened in the 1920s, the 1930s, and then it just changed completely from being, say, I, I don't really like the word backward countries, but they were not really developed as modern states. They didn't have an education system, health system, roads, so on. They didn't even have borders. So I mean, the borders that are there today, separating those countries, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, so on, they were created during the Soviet Union in the 1920s, 1930s. So it was thanks to Stalin and the <laughs> Let's not thank Stalin for anything. <laughs> um, so, so you moved on then, you, you, you wrote uh, Sovietistan, which is also translated into English, um, another fantastic book. And then that was followed by The Border, which is your journey um, round Russia through. And I'm going to list them here because it's quite an extraordinary achievement that you went to all these countries. Um, 2017 was when this book came out, The Border, a journey around Russia through North Korea, China, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, Poland, Latvia, Estonia, Finland, Norway, thank goodness, and the Northeast Passage. Now that is an absolute phenomenon. What a journey. I mean, how long did that take you? Uh, 259 days. Uh, all in all. How uh, long? 259 days. So, uh, gosh, that's not actually very long, is it? Uh, well, uh, to cover that distance. It's long enough, I would say. <laughs> um, I remember when I got the idea, the first thing when I did, when I woke up after having that dream, uh, was to go to Amazon, because I did think that the idea was so good uh, that I imagined that that book must already exist. I'm sure that someone else has already written that book because it kind of seemed like an obvious idea as well. Uh, and then to my great joy, I discovered that no, this book does not exist yet. Um, so I decided to write it and write it quickly before anyone else got that <laughs> idea. And then when I was doing that journey, uh, somewhere along the way, it dawned upon me why no one else had bothered to write that book, because it was a very, very long journey, um, but extremely interesting. Um, through most of the journey, I could actually manage by speaking Russian, from Kazakhstan to Estonia, says something about the legacy of the Soviet Union. I mean, most of the countries I traveled to uh, had been part of the Soviet Union, or at least the Russian Empire. And also, among those 14 countries, um, only one, Norway, has never been at war with or occupied by Russia. It also says something about what it means to be the neighbor of Russia. So was that the question you asked yourself? I mean, Norway, as you say, is the only country that hadn't been invaded, but nevertheless, 
borders Russia. So what was, what was the question you were asking in that book? Well, uh, the main question was very simple. Just what, what does it mean to have Russia as your neighbor? How does that um, affect the people living in that border zone? And the stories, uh, the tragedies are so many. Uh, from forced exile deportations during the Soviet Union. I mean, just if you travel through Kazakhstan today, um, you will meet so many nationalities, Germans, Chechens, um, Tatars, and so on. And they are living in Kazakhstan today because their families were moved there during the Soviet Union. And that's kind of the story of the whole um, Russian Empire that the one little person did not mean so much. It was the state, the ideas that mattered. Uh, so that whole border is lined with tragedies, I would say. So was tragedy the overwhelming experience to, that, you, that you took away from that? Uh, well, uh, I don't want to sound too depressing, but of course, it is a, it's, a, it's been a very violent border. It's a very violent story. Uh, it's a border that has moved a lot. Uh, if you look at history, it's been a very active border. So Russia did not have colonies like um, Great Britain had, uh, but they just expanded the border, which of course meant that being the neighbor of Russia was something very dangerous. Um, but it's also a fascinating border where traveled through so many different cultures, through so many different um, languages, landscapes. Um, I mean, it is a fascinating thought that the only country between Norway and North Korea is Russia, only one country between us. Amazing. There is one wonderful story, I actually wrote it down, um, which you'll be able to read in, in the book as well. It's about, um, set in, in Turkmenistan, and it's about the young woman, the, the poet, um, Ulguna, I think her name is. Um, do, do read this story, because it's such an extraordinary story. It's about this young woman who, she has almost no education, I think, and she lives in a yurt, and she is the most gifted poet, one of the most gifted poets you've ever come across, I think, too. Extraordinary story. Um, now, bring us up to date with the Himalayas, because you've done another difficult journey, <laughs> challenging one. Um, and tell us about that, and you're going to do a reading from your latest book. Mm -hmm. So, after working for more or less 10 years with Russia and the former Soviet Union, I decided that I needed a break from Russia. Um, so I asked myself, well, um, what could be more interesting, more fascinating than Russia? Because it is extremely fascinating. That's why, that's why I keep going back. Uh, first and foremost, people are very fascinating. It's not just tragedy, but it's also, when you talk about the Russian soul, it's a cliché. But it's not just a cliché. There's always some... It's the eternal <laughs> fascination. I mean, yeah. you heard Peter Frankaban today talking about his next big book is about Russia. You never leave it. Do no, you? no. You, you can't. You have to come back. But I decided to have a break uh, from Russia. And then I asked myself, well, what, what is more fascinating than Russia? And then the answer just gave itself. Well, of course, it has to be the uh, highest mountain range on Earth, the Himalaya, which is also an extremely fascinating region uh, where so many different ethnic groups and nationalities are living there. So, I mean, technically, I travel through five countries, China, Pakistan, India, Nepal, and Bhutan. But in reality, I travel through um, many, many more because uh, in each valley in the Himalayas, because of the topography, uh, you actually come through to, I would say, a different nation where people have their own language, different um, ways of dressing, different ways of um, practicing religion, and so on. So it's one of the, see, the richest um, uh, regions in the world in terms of diversity. And then also, uh, like Kapka, I'm extremely fascinated with uh, borders. And you could see the mountain range, like a physical border, a barrier, between the two most populous countries on Earth. And it's also, um, geopolitically, it's an extremely interesting region. Um, when you look at the borders in 
the Himalaya, uh, those red lines uh, dissolve and they become dotted lines because so many of the borders are disputed. Um, the border between Pakistan and India, obviously, with Kashmir, but also the border between uh, India and, um, and China. So, would you be kind enough to read a passage as well? And this is not yet out in English, but you're very lucky it's out in German. So, um, you're going to read in German. I'll do my best. So, I chose this passage since the theme of the conversation was um, female travelers. So, what does it mean to be a female traveler? I find it a huge advantage. Am nächsten Tag stellte mich Achtar einem Freund vor, Muxalin Khan. Muxalin möchte Ihnen gern das Dorf zeigen, sagte er. Ich bin ein Mann und habe hier keine Verwandten, also darf ich nicht hinein. Aber ich schon? Ja, natürlich. Sie sind ja eine Frau. Mursalin hatte ein schmales Gesicht, eine spitze Nase, Vollbart und tiefe Runzeln. Er sah aus, als wäre er deutlich über 50, aber er sei erst 34, behauptete er, ebenso alt wie ich. Das Dorf lag hinter einem Zaun direkt gegenüber dem Polofeld. Was sich hinter diesem Zaun befand, gehörte zu einer verborgenen Welt. Welches Land würden Sie denn bevorzugen? fragte ich weiter. Sie könnte aus jedem Land kommen, Japan, Frankreich, Deutschland, Korea. Das ist nicht so wichtig. Hauptsache, wir verstehen uns und respektieren einander. Was, glauben Sie, wird die ausländische Frau davon halten, dass sie bereits eine Frau und acht Kinder hier in Pakistan haben? Ich werde eine Frau finden müssen, die tolerant ist, antwortete Mursalin. Gegenseitiges Verständnis ist wichtig. Gestern war ich Guide für eine Deutsche. Ich führte sie hier in den Bergen herum. Unterwegs erzählte ich ihr von meinem Plan, so wie ich es jetzt auch Ihnen erzähle. Sie wurde richtig böse und sagte, sie habe einen Freund zu Hause und hinterher weigerte sie sich, weiter mit mir zu reden. Es war ziemlich dumm, dass es so endete. Ich verstehe nicht, warum sie so böse geworden ist. Fantastic. So toll auf Deutsch gelesen. No? <laughs> Thank you, and uh, it's translated then by uh, Ulrich Sonnenberg. Amazing. I'm glad you mentioned the translator. We must always mention the translator. And Kapka, I don't know whether you were able to, to whether German is one of your language, but we'll send you the translation of that because there is a translation that I've been able to read as well. Um, you, you, Can I just mention yes. my translator because Please. translators are in a way, co-authors, they are so important and um, they don't get any of the credit and they have, you know, half the credit for, you know, for a well-translated book, Brigitte Hilsensauer yes. is, is my wonderful translator. That's so good. I'm so glad you do because I try every single time to mention. Thank you. Um, and you'll be able to, as I say, buy both Kapka and Erica's books outside. But if you're listening at home as well, do go to your local bookshop and buy the books because we've got to keep all the bookshops going as well. Now, you've brought it very fantastically round to women and um, travel again. And I think that's how I want to spend our last five minutes is talking very specifically about women and travel. Now, I mentioned it right at the beginning. I didn't want to spend the whole time talking about that because, in a way, you're just great writers and great travellers, but you are women. And there are other things you have to take into account when you travel. Now, Kapka, I wonder for you, what is it like for you as a solo female traveller? Because both of you travel on your own. Mm. Well, Erica said it. Um, you know, it's an advantage. Um, for me as well and um, there are risks but I think in terms of the storytelling the story hunting if you like um, I would never um, 
be able to get to places, get close to people, um, hear what I've heard, experience what I've experienced. If I didn't have um, a woman's approach, and by that I mean um, both from within, but also how I'm seen from without, because I think the great advantage of a woman traveler or a woman explorer is, you know, a woman stranger in town <laughs> is that you are not seen as threatening. Um, you know, in, in some of the places where, you know, where I've been and where Erica has been, a man, you know, a male stranger would be seen, you know, perhaps with a, you know, if not with suspicion, then with a bit of caution. But the woman is seen as someone who obviously depends on your personality as well. Um, so that's the first advantage um, that you have. You also have access to both men and women in their homes. Um, you know, the excerpt that Erica just read as a woman. So that if you enter, for example, um, I don't know, a more conservative household, a Muslim household, the women will open their arms to you. Um, and, you know, I think people, pe everyone wants to talk about themselves. And I think what a woman can bring, again, it depends on, on your, on, on how curious you are, is um, that kind of listening capacity and holding, just holding somebody's story, um, no matter how heavy it is or how weird it is or how painful it is, if you can hold it, then it will be given to you. And I, I think that has been my huge joy and privilege um, on, on these journeys uh, as, as a solo woman traveler. And have you encountered dangers because you're a woman as well? I mean, you're dealing in quite patriarchal societies, both of you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you have to obviously be very aware of your environment as a traveler anyway. Um, so awareness and connectedness with, um, I think, the body language of people around you, which is difficult in cultures that you're not familiar with, where you are, you know, really on somebody else's turf. It can be a challenge. But I think really the only terrifying situations in which I've been, which actually I write about in my previous book, Border, um, were a result of me going too far. I went too far to get close to the border. I went too far, you know. I, I became involved with people who are, uh, you know, smugglers, transaction men, and it is, yes, as you said, you know, a very male kind of, the, the border in particular can be a very male environment. Um, so it was my own kind of, um, and my is, own doing. Is that, is that because, you know, at a certain point you are an adventurer, you are an explorer, you just want to go that one step further? Or is it because you just hadn't done yeah. any research about that particular area? It's, it's difficult. I think some things cannot be researched because no. um, they are what's on the ground and situations arise spontaneously. And sometimes it is the nature of a place, it is the nature of a border zone deep in the forest where you have no phone signal. Mm. Um, it is the nature of the place that you will experience terror. And I guess I wanted to experience the complete border experience in that book, and I did. So in the end, it and did serve, it served a purpose to a certain degree that you put yourself in danger. Interesting. I think everything has to serve a purpose, and ultimately it's not about me, you know? The journey is not about me. It's, it is about an encounter. It is about relationship. Erica, um, same question to you. I mean, you, you have traveled so widely and so um, bravely, too. Is there a problem for you as a, as a solo female traveler, or is it an advantage? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with everything Kapka said, that it's, um, it's, it's absolutely an advantage. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, you're not seen as a threat, and, and you have access to uh, not only men, but women as well. So uh, I'm asked this question all the time. Uh, what does it mean to travel in the world as a, as a woman? Is it not dangerous? So people seem to think of it as a disadvantage. Uh, but I've never heard um, 
uh, male travel writer get that question, what does it mean for you to travel in the world as a man? And I think that's actually the question that should be asked. Because as a man, for instance, traveling in Pakistan, it would be very, very difficult for him to talk with the women. Um, when I was in Nepal, I did a lot of research about um, sex trafficking and about these menstruation huts that they practice in the countryside in Nepal. And when I was traveling in the Himalaya, I was, since I don't speak the local languages, I was um, for the first time uh, dependent more on translators and fixers and helpers and guides. And I always tried to get female uh, helpers because I knew that with a man it would be difficult to ask these kind of questions, to get this kind of access. And also in my uh, experience, um, women are much better with people. I've had so many clumsy male translators who's kind of ruin the interview, uh, whereas a woman seems to um, be better at asking the questions in a more appropriate way. I can feel another whole panel discussion coming on now, so <laughs> how, we, how, we, how we ask questions too. That's, that's fascinating. Now to end, um, and, and what an incredible hour and a half this has been. It's gone so quickly and there's, there's so much more I could ask you, genuinely. Um, I just wanted to end on female travel writers. And I'd love you to be able to um, give me an example of one as a to take away. And I just want to tell you of a few that I found, and some I knew already, and because just so few of them are unknown. So many, so few, there are so many, in fact. That's what was surprising to me. But I looked at 55 books, and only four of them were women travel writers, 55 travel books. And, um, but I'm going to tell you about a few more, just for you to take them away, and then Kapka and Erica can think of which ones they're going to recommend. Um, the Nomad by Isabel Eberhardt, amazing book, 1877, she was born. Incredible woman, Isabel Eberhardt. There's Dervla Murphy, who's the um, Irish travel writer. I've had the great um, experience interviewing her once. She wrote Full Tilt, Ireland to India. Rebecca Solnit, it's a great travel writer, great writer, full stop. Beryl Markham, another great name. Maybe there's some Norwegian names you're going to throw into the mix as well. Um, Isabel Bur Isabella Bird, probably heard of her. Six Months in the Sandwich Islands. Uh, she went to um, Hawaii. And let me see, there was, oh, Martha Gellhorn. How could we ever forget Martha Gellhorn? People talk mostly about Ernest Hemingway, but in fact, Martha Gellhorn was the woman he spent 10 years of his life with. And in fact, she's one of the most remarkable journalists of the 20th century as well. And um, her book is called Travels with Myself and Another. And the, the another is actually Ernest Hemingway, who she doesn't mention by name through the whole book. I rest my case. Um, right, Kapka, a recommendation from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I mean, I just want to mention um, a writer who um, I think encapsulates for me what travel writing can be, you know, at its highest kind of octave, and that's Rebecca West. Mm -hmm. You know, the British writer Rebecca West, okay, she did write, you know, she's from another era, but I think her book about Yugoslavia, um, Black Lamb, Grey Falcon, is um, a masterpiece of literature. It is not just a masterpiece of travel writing. You know, it's a book about Yugoslavia. It's a book about why the Balkans, that's us. It's a book about the human condition. So it's a book about places, people. Um, it's a book of philosophy. You know, she was a great writer on the human condition and she simply used the Western Balkans, you know, then Yugoslavia as her prism through which she wrote about the human condition. And, you know, Rebecca West is for me, I think, a paragon of, of of great travel writing. And I want to mention one other book which has just come out in English translation by the French anthropologist, Nastasia Martin, um, which in French um, is called um, Croix au Fauve, and in English it's called Into the Eye of the Wild, and it's just out this month in English. This, is, this book blew me away. Nastasia Martin is an anthropologist who specializes in um, the far north. 
And I just urge everyone to read. We will. I hope somebody's writing down all these fantastic recommendations we're getting. And we have our resident anthropologist. Um, what are you going to recommend, Erica? Okay, from, from what I'm heard, I've heard today, I'm, I'm very sure that Kapka will be my new favorite. <laughs> um, and then I would like to recommend, I, I know she doesn't see herself as a travel writer, but she does write about um, places far away. So, Austin Sayastad. The Norwegian writer, a journalist, and she's now working on a book about USA, and I'm very curious um, what she will make of it. And then, since I was talking so negatively about male travel writers, um, I would actually like to, to talk about my favorite, uh, which is the Polish um, writer and correspondent, uh, Richard Kabuczynski, uh, which just, I, to call it travel writing is um, not enough. It's, it's great literature. It certainly is, and uh, I'll let you get away with one man, because in fact, you have been compared to Kapuczynski, so I can quite understand the affinity there. That has been incredible. Thank you so much to Kapka Kavasabova in Scotland. Um, wonderful to have you with us, Kapka. Thank you so much. And to Erica Fatlin here with us in Krems and from Oslo. It's just been great. Two great women, two great writers, two great everything. Thank you, all of you, very, very much. Thank you.